Um, yeah, we typically meet uh, every other Thursday around noon uh, in this room, or you can join us online. And before we get started, I would like to provide a land acknowledgement. So we respectfully acknowledge in the land in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothuk and the Mi'kmaq. Uh, we would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanatsivut and Nunatsi Kavut and the Innu of Nitsan and their ancestors as the original peoples of Labrador. We strive for respectful relations with all peoples in this province as we search for a collective healing and true rec reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So we are joined today by Dr. Marcia Chasson, uh, who is a biologist whose academic journey has been marked by a commitment to aquatic animal physiology and genetics. After obtaining her bachelor's of science and master's of science degrees uh, in biology at the University of New Brunswick, she pursued a passion further by earning her doctor of philosophy degree at the University of Guelph, where she focused towards genetics and breeding within the aquatic realm. Driven by a desire for practical application, she embarked on a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center of Aquaculture Technologies Canada, followed by a tenure at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. In 2018, Dr. Chasson returned to her academic roots at the University of Guelph, taking the reins as the manager of the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. Her dedication extends beyond the research and academia by volunteering as a board member for both Ontario Aquaculture Association and the Aqu Aquaculture Association of Canada. And with that, I will give it to pass it on to Marcia. All right. Thank you, Gordon. Um, and thanks guys for having me here today. Uh, I am going to talk to you a little bit about Lake Whitefish and how we are investigating this as a novel species for aquaculture in Ontario. But we're also hoping that um, any successes that we see might be able to be extend towards um, more, uh, more provinces in, in Canada as well, because this is a fairly widespread fish across our country. So I'm coming to you today from the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. And there's a photo of our research center that you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, we're located about 35 kilometers north of Guelph, uh, nestled in the tiny little town of Ulna. So we are the one fish farm surrounded by all kinds of other agriculture, uh, notably with crop and, uh, and livestock production. So I plan to chat with you today. Um, Briefly, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Lake Whitefish, and then I want to define the problem that we are talking about and then discussing how aquaculture might be viewed as a potential solution. Uh, we're going to review our efforts to date for captive culture of Lake Whitefish, and this is going to include uh, spawning or reproduction, uh, incubation of eggs and early rearing, the little bit of data that we've collected so far uh, with respect to growth, and then some nutrition trials that we have run as well. And then we're going to discuss uh, where we're going next. So we have a couple of ideas already for where we'd like to go in the future with um, additional research efforts, and then some next steps towards commercialization of the species. So first, uh, the lake whitefish, what is it? It is a subfamily of the, sal the salmon family, so Salmonidae. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about salmon, trout, chars, and the whitefish. It's a freshwater fish that's found throughout Canada and the northern United States. It was once very abundant in the Great Lakes, and it has historically been quite valuable for commercial fishing. So this species in particular is a fall spawner. So it's actually a, uh, a couple of weeks from now in November is generally where we start to see them reproducing. And they like to spawn on shallow shoals in the Great Lakes. So the eggs are deposited there. Um, the, they have a very long incubation period and then the sac fry will not hatch out until the spring. Those larval fish hatch out at a very, very small size and they tend to feed on zooplankton at this time. As they grow, the juveniles and adults will change their feeding behavior and start feeding off of bottom dwelling animals. So they actually have a subterminal mouth. So they will pick up small snails and other invertebrates off of the bottom. 
And then what we traditionally know about this species is that the adults are found in fairly deep water and, uh, you know, sometimes up to 200 feet deep. And then they go back to those shallow uh, shoals again in the fall to spawn. So what are we talking about in terms of the problem with this species? Well, there's a couple of different things that are at play right now. Uh, climate change we know is increasing the temperatures in the Great Lakes. We're seeing warmer and warmer water temperatures every season that passes. Um, the introduction of invasive species, specifically I'm referring to zebra mussels and quagga mussels, have also affected the benthic food webs in these waterways. And these two things, in, in collaboration with others as well, have had a significant effect on survival and recruitment of lake whitefish. In the Great Lakes, there's some areas that we have actually measured a 70% decline in lake whitefish populations from historical numbers. Um, and in these areas that the lake whitefish is actually identified as a species at risk. That, now that's not across the entire Great Lakes water system, but um, it's definitely concerning, especially the issue of recruitment, not getting any of these juvenile fish surviving to adulthood in order to be able to contribute to the next generation is very concerning for this species. So there's obviously a number of ways that we can approach this. Um, we can try to fight climate change. We can try to improve environmental um, parameters for these fish. We can try to do some restocking efforts. Uh, but what I wanna talk about today is about aquaculture as a potential solution. So first and foremost, we wanted to know if lake whitefish could be grown in captivity to supplement capture fisheries. So can we actually use aquaculture as a means to produce these fish so that we could feed humans the aquaculture or the farmed fish so that we could re reduce our reliance on the wild capture. In theory, this would hopefully allow for these wild stocks an opportunity to recover if the fishing pressure wasn't as great. And as well, the question also remains of can we use commercial culture techniques to apply to stocking programs? So can we use the same idea or the same principles to grow juvenile fish to release them into some of these waterways in a hope that some of those animals will survive to adulthood and reproduce? So this idea of trying to grow lake whitefish in commercial aquaculture is fairly new, but it actually has been done from commercial or sorry from restocking program perspective for many years the um, the ontario ministry of natural resources and forestry has been looking into whether or not they could culture this species in captivity for the purpose of restocking but in terms of aquaculture it's very recently that we started pitching this idea so it actually comes from a very humble beginning there was two um, guys from the Manitoulin Island area in Ontario, they decided to take matters into their own hands. One of them had a little bit of experience with aquaculture, the other one was a commercial fisherman. And between the two of them, they came up with this idea that, well, maybe we could harvest some of these wild eggs and sperm, mix them together, see if we could fertilize them, and then maybe we could grow them using the same technology that we use for rainbow trout, because rainbow trout is very prevalent in and around Manitoulin Island, and there's a lot of people who grow these fish. So this idea formed New North Fisheries, and they were specifically interested in trying to see if they could grow lake whitefish under captive conditions. So one of these partners is a commercial fisherman, and he would be harvesting these animals in November when they were spawning anyway. So when they were harvesting the adult fish um, they also came on board and they took some eggs and some sperm. So the first egg collection uh, was in 2016, I think, and they just literally put them in a garbage pail, like a plastic garbage pail, and they did water changes every two days, like maybe you would with an aquarium, and they used a small aquarium pump to aerate the water just to see if it could be done. And three months later, they actually had some fish hatch out of these eggs, so they thought, hey, Maybe this is something that we could actually get started with. So they made the proposal um, to ourselves and to College Boreal that we should collaborate with them on a project. And so we were able to apply to funding through NSERC uh, just to try and basically establish the baseline practices for how we might be able to grow these fish commercially. So three partners, College Boreal is north of us in Sudbury. New North Fisheries is also north of our location on Manitoulin Island. And those two locations are considerably closer to each other. And then of course, we're quite a bit farther south uh, down by Waterloo, Guelph, you know, greater Toronto area. So the way that this worked was the fishermen went out, 
they collected the commercial fish, harvested the eggs and the sperm, mixed them together, and then they took those fertilized eggs and they brought them to College Boreal. College Boreal has a fairly small incubation facility where they were able to incubate these eggs for, um, took them about 100 days before they started to hatch. And then once they hatched out and they got them onto feed, they were transferred down south to our facility at the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. So our goal was just trying to grow those fish up to a fingerling size. And we didn't even know what that meant at this time. So when we're talking about a fingerling size for rainbow trout, it might be anywhere from 20 grams to 200 grams, depending on the producer and the production site. But basically for Lake Whitefish, we didn't know what size we needed. And so we were just trying to see how fast we could grow them and what size we could reach before we wanted to transfer them into the into an open water rearing environment. And that's where New North Fisheries came in. So New North Fisheries actually built a, um, an open water net pen that is very similar to what we use in the traditional rainbow trout farming industry, but they modified it in a way that this net pen can be raised up in the water and it can be sunken down. So they can actually move the open net pen in the water um, to keep it in good water temperature and they can keep it down below the surface all winter to avoid ice buildup. So it's actually a fairly innovative technology. So the first year that we did this like whitefish introduction, um, 55,000 eggs were collected and then we reared them to about a size of five grams, in, which is when they, they reached that in early June. And we introduced, from that 55,000 eggs, we introduced 42,000 fry to the net pen site uh, owned by New North Fisheries. So the first cohort that we placed in that net pen were ready to harvest about two years after they were stocked. So that's considerably longer than what we would expect for a rainbow trout. And the size variation was quite large as well. So some fish were as small as 900 grams when they harvested them and other ones were larger than two kilos. So it goes to show you that when we're dealing with wild fish, we're dealing with a large amount of variation in our genetic pool and there's going to be varying growth rates. So that's one of those things that we need to kind of keep in mind as we go forward with respect to commercialization. So overall, New North Fisheries was able to harvest 27 tons, and that um, was actually not very difficult for them to find a market for because there's a very large market for late whitefish in the province of Ontario. So for our part of this collaboration, our goals were very simple at the beginning. We just wanted to learn how to keep the fish alive. We wanted to learn as much as we could while we had those fish in our hands with respect to how do they survive? How, what does their growth rate look like? How do they feed? What kind of husbandry techniques do we use? So can we use the same as what we would use for trout and char or do we have to vary on that? And then that kind of leads into stocking density and, and how many animals we could actually put into a rearing unit. So the photo that you see in front of you is one of our larger hatching troughs where some of the juvenile whitefish are placed. And those guys are so tiny. When they hatch out of their egg, they basically look like a thread. They're a very small fish compared to the trout and the char that we're used to dealing with. So it did actually mean that we had to change a lot of our husbandry practices because of the size of the animal. So what we learned in the first couple of years of our collaboration with New North Fisheries was basically that at hatch, those fry are too small for a commercial uh, trout rearing equipment. And they also have almost no yolk sac to speak of. So when we talk about our trout and our char production, those animals usually hatch out of an egg with a large yolk reserve. So a large amount of internal energy that they can rely on for the first 10 to 14 days. And it's only after that yolk has been absorbed that we have to worry about giving them food. With the lake whitefish, because they have almost no yolk reserve, we have to immediately provide them with food. And because they're so small, we had to give them a very small micro pelleted diet. So we found that the scredding diet, the Gemma line, was, uh, worked well for them. There's also a European diet called Aglo Norse that worked well also, like either or was relatively palatable to these fish and the size was good. It's just much easier for us to purchase uh, scredding in Canada because they have, they have actually um, locations in Canada that we can buy from. So we also found that if we uh, were able to increase the water temperature, which we accomplished at our facility using recirculating aquaculture technology or RAS, 
we could actually get those fry to double or sometimes triple in size every two weeks, which is getting, giving them a pretty good head start in their growth. We also had very good survival. So survival from first feeding to five grams was generally greater than 75%. And compared to some of the other wild uh, stocks that we've worked with in the past, we were very impressed to see such great survival. We also learned that our maximum stocking density, so that's the total amount of biomass of animals that we could put in a rearing unit, seemed to vary by size. So when those fish were small, when they immediately hatched out, uh, from basically zero to one grams, we had to keep the stocking density very low, below eight kilograms per cubic meter. If we didn't keep the stocking density low and we allowed it to grow, they would get stressed and they would start to have, have health issues. Once we got those fish greater than one gram in body weight, we were able to increase the stocking density to about 30 kilograms per cubic meter. That sounds like a considerable increase compared to the eight that we use when the fish are small, but just to give you a bit of comparison with our rainbow trout, we generally stock them somewhere between 45 and 55 kilograms per cubic meter. And with our Arctic char, we can go as high as 100 kilograms per cubic meter. So there's still a, a fairly low density is required to grow these fish. So we worked with, through this NSERC project with College Boreal and New North Fisheries for four years. Um, and during this time, we kept a few hundred animals back from every cohort that came through our doors. So 95% of the fish left our facility, they went onto a shipping truck and they went back up to Manitoulin Island to New North Fisheries where they would try to grow them out to a market size. But we kept a few number of individuals back every year because my personal belief is that I don't want to rely on wild capture of gametes in order to support a farming industry. So if this Lake whitefish is going to be commercialized as an aquaculture species. I think it's very important that we establish a captive breeding population. So that was my next big focus. So we figured that these fish would mature at three years of age, like the other salmonids that we work with, specifically the trout and the char. So we kept these fish for three years. And then during that kind of fall spawning period that we would see in the wild, we sedated the animals and we checked them to see if they were expressing any gametes. We found that a very few number of males did produce some small quantities of sperm at three years of age, but absolutely none of the females had eggs. And this was a little bit concerning for us because we were wondering when these fish were going to mature. So we dove into the literature and we took a look at what we know of from ecological studies of these fish, and we found that uh, they actually have a little bit of a longer life cycle. So um, many fish will mature at four, but some won't even mature until five years of age. So when it came around time for four years of age and we, want, we were getting worried about whether or not these fish were gonna mature at that time, we actually brought in a um, ultrasound machine and we sedated the fish and we did a number of ultrasounds on all of the uh, animals to try and see if there was any egg mass development. And that's what this image is showing on the screen. All of those circular bits in this ultrasound image is part of the egg mass. So once we were able to see that eggs were developing inside the fish, we felt a lot better that we were on the right track. Now, the problem was when we got to four years of age, we checked the animals again, and we only had four females that produced eggs. So what we learned is that our females actually didn't start to reliably produce eggs until they were five years of age. But by four years of age, most of the males were producing sperm. So at five years of age, we finally got some good gamete collections. Uh, but also, we didn't really know how to categorize these eggs. When we look at a rainbow trout or an Arctic char egg, they're quite a bit larger. I would compare them in size to that of like a green pea. Whereas the lake whitefish eggs are basically the size of a pinhead. They're considerably smaller, they're a different color, and it's hard to apply the same grading process that we would for trout to these eggs. So we basically made it up as we go. So we scored them by a numerical system. So giving them a score of three, they were very yellow, there was lots of them. We presumed that they were good quality. Um, score of two looked like eggs of low quality or quantity. And then when we get down to scores of one and zero, these were eggs that we thought were overripe um, or, or they were shells or contaminated. So we use this numerical system to try and just figure out 
how many fish we were, were we getting that were producing eggs and then how many of those eggs that we were getting were actually considered good eggs. We also wanted to know if we could use the same type of spawning techniques that we use for trout and char in Lake Whitefish. And the answer is not exactly. So with trout and char, these animals will go through um, maturation where they'll start to develop secondary uh, sexual characteristics. So if you look at a female trout, it's going to be a little bit more silver. It's gonna be uh, rounder. It's gonna have a soft abdomen. Whereas if you look at a male trout, they often have a dorsal hump. They might have an elongated lower jaw, and then their abdomen is quite a bit more firm and triangular shaped. So we can look at these two animals and we can most of the time immediately tell the difference between the sexes. But with the lake whitefish, that didn't happen. So there's no secondary sexual characteristics in this species that you can easily determine with the naked eye. We basically had to sedate these fish every single week and do a gamete check to see if there was any gametes being expressed. So the photo that you see here of the female being expressed into that plastic cup, this is actually a six-year-old female that's giving us a pretty good stream of eggs. What we found at year five when these females reproduced for the first time is that we actually had to very much manually express those eggs. So with the trout or a char, generally as soon as you lift the head up above the tail, the eggs kind of just fall out. Uh, and that was not the case with our Lake Whitefish we had to gently rub the abdomen or massage the abdomen to get those eggs out. So it seems like what our experience to date indicates that the older the fish, the easier it is to harvest those eggs. And with the males, which is represented in the other two photos on this slide, it was a little bit different as well. When you try to harvest sperm or milt from a trout, you generally just have to do a quick rub of the abdomen and it will express immediately from the gomatal pore. In the case of the whitefish, it doesn't come out in a shoot. You actually have to collect it with a micropipetter or an eyedropper. So it added a little bit of complexity to uh, harvesting the gametes of this species. So in the first year, I've got two graphs on this slide. One is 2021 spawning dates. The other one is 2022 spawning dates. And so I just show you this to try and give you an idea of our limited amount of success so far. Um, the green bars on these graphs represent the eggs that we thought were good quality, so those that we assigned an egg score of three. And then the yellow is kind of like maybe those are good eggs, we're not really sure. And then the red was we knew that they were bad or zero was completely like we're not even going to keep these guys. So just to give you an idea, we ended up with these fairly broad spawning windows and we really didn't get a whole lot of um, eggs that we categorized as three in our two spawning years that we've had to date. We haven't spawning, started spawning yet for 2023, so I'm hoping that we can improve our numbers as we go forward. But um, we did have a lot of success when it came to egg incubation. So we tried to incubate these this species at around five degrees. Our chiller kind of gives us a little bit of leeway, plus or minus um, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. Um, but because they're incubated at such a low temperature, they have a very long developmental rate. So basically, we started to see our hatching somewhere between 90 and 98 days. But in, at day zero, we water hardened the eggs. We found that they doubled in size. From days one to three, we started to see that the proteins would co coagulate in the unfertilized eggs, causing those eggs to turn white. Then we could easily tell which eggs were fertilized and which weren't. Around day seven, we started to see signs of fungus. So we always have some kind of water mold in natural water sources anywhere that you'll encounter in the province. And what happens is those water mold spores will settle out on these dead eggs and they'll start to proliferate. So that's a problem for aquaculture producers because once that fungus starts to grow, it'll spread to live eggs and it can completely take over your, your egg incubation. So it's something that we have to try and manage. We found that our greatest amount of mortality was between that seven to 25 days. And we think that that was mostly correlated with our fungus growth. Once we got past day 25, our egg mortality decreased. And then it was just management um, until we hatched. And then once we got to our hatching stage, it was a whole, a whole nother thing that we had to worry about. But during this time, we took a couple of eggs every three days from when we fertilize them until they reach the eye stage. And that's what you can see here in these different images. So we wanted to track how those embryos developed. 
Because in the first year that we did this, we actually weren't sure that we were getting success, that we saw that the eggs were in the jar. We saw that we, you know, they hadn't turned white yet, but we still weren't sure that they had actually fertilized. So it wasn't until we could start to see the embryo um, which you can see in G, you can see one of the eyes starting, the lens of the eye starting to form. H, it's a lot more clear because there's some pigmentation in that eye. And then of course, um, at photo I there, you can absolutely see that there, there's a little fish in that egg, which made us very excited that we knew that we were actually gonna get some, some white fish this year. So with our breeding efforts, we found that uh, this species has a very broad spawning window when it's held in captivity. We know that it doesn't have such a broad spawning window in the wild. And we found particularly with the females, it took them five years to reach the stage where we were able to reliably collect eggs. The males did mature a little bit sooner at four years where we could reliably get sperm. Um, we did have to change or modify our manual spawning techniques a little bit. So instead of, um, you know, one or two um, strips, stripping motions with our hands. We had to do a small manual or abdomen massage in order to get the eggs out. Uh, we found that our egg mortality is greatest from about seven to 25 days after fertilization. The eyed stage was hit at 35 days. And of course, this is always gonna be dependent on the water temperature because with these species, if you increase the water temperature, they develop a little faster. And if you decrease the water temperature, they develop a little bit slower. But with the water temperatures that we were able to achieve, which was generally around five degrees, we were able to get our hatch at 98 degrees, 98 degrees, sorry, 98 days post fertilization. So it took us a really long time to, to get to where we actually had some viable fish. Once we had viable fish, we had to worry about, well, how are we going to feed them? So this graph shows you a couple of different examples of different feed types that we tried. Uh, we tried using a commercial feed and that's the Gemma diet produced by Scredding. You can see it in the green line and it's obviously uh, by this graph shows you that it had the best performance in terms of growth. These fish were grown in our flow through tank system at about 10 degrees Celsius. And we tried producing rotifers in house as well as Artemia or brine shrimp. And we did two different types of Artemia. So we had Artemia that we just hatched and fed to the fish. And then we also had Artemia that we put through an enrichment, um, a hufa enrichment, which is highly unsaturated fatty acids. Now there's some evidence in the literature that if you give fish these hufas early in development, that actually results in better growth. We didn't really see that in this study, but I think I, I, think I know why. So over the period of time that we did this, we evaluated the amount of survival and the growth that we had. And you can see in the blue line with the rotifers, we had terrible growth and we had such bad survival that we actually ended, um, we ended that part of the trial at the T3 sampling because there was just too many fish that were dying. With the Artemia groups, which you can see in the yellow and the red lines, they actually outperformed the artificial or the commercial diet at first. It wasn't until T4 sampling where those started to plateau. And we think that the reason why they plateaued at that stage was not because the diet wasn't good for the fish. It was because we weren't producing enough of it. We didn't realize that we were limiting the growth of the animals by not producing enough Artemia. So you can see at T5, the, the uh, orange and the red lines start to increase again because we doubled up on our production of Artemia and we were able to kind of get those fish growing again at a good rate. So after we did this early, uh, first feeding trial, we kind of determined that we figured the Gemma diet works very well, but we also saw that behaviorally the fish seemed to be very um, triggered in their feeding response by adding in the live feed, which was the Artemia. So I think going forward, we would recommend that you could do both because they feed well on the Gemma diet, but if you throw some brine shrimp in there, it actually stimulates their feeding behavior. So we took these fish and we kind of carried on uh, this study of looking at growth performance but we did a little bit different and we moved them into cold water, which was eight and a half degrees, which is our, down, our groundwater temperature. And then we moved some of the fish into 15 degrees Celsius in our recirculating aquaculture system. So we wanted to get an idea of whether or not there would be a difference in growth at these two temperatures. Because from a fish farmer's perspective, they wanna know how can I get my fish to a bigger fingerling size to stock them at a bigger size, hopefully giving them a little bit of a growth advantage as we move them into those grow out sites. So what we found here 
was very clear in this graph where the 15 degree um, water temperature in the yellow line drastically out compared or out competed with those fish in, in the eight and a half degree water temperature. So it didn't seem to have much of a difference until about day 63 after hatch. But once they got to that point, they just rapidly started growing uh, at a significantly higher rate and the cold water fish never really caught up to them. So from this little bit of effort that we did looking at the early rearing phase, we figured out with absolute certainty that rotifers are not a good choice for lake whitefish and the Artemia seemed to stimulate the feeding behavior. We did not find any effect on survival or growth when we used the Artemia that had enrichment. So that's the, the hoofa enrichment. Now, I think that the reason there was because when you go through that hoofa enrichment, there's a washing stage. So I think we ended up washing some of the Artemia down the drain. So the volume of Artemia was probably a little bit less going into those replicates compared to the Artemia that hadn't been um, treated with the hoofa. So the groups that were fed the Artemia definitely outperformed the controls for the first six weeks. And I think that your limiting factor here is going to be the amount of Artemia that you can produce. We found that once those fish reached about one gram in body weight, we were able to transition them onto a trout diet or a crumble, which is what we would start our recently hatched trout onto. We don't have any diets for this species. So we basically have to use whatever diet we have available to us. And in our situation, the trout diet is what we have, so that's what we've been feeding them, and we've seen reasonable success on this. We did prove that increased water temperature has a significant effect on the growth of this species, and so it may be that if we want to make this species viable for commercial aquaculture, we might have to consider growing them in recirculating aquaculture systems. So that brings me to nutrition. We did a couple of different studies looking at nutrition um, because First of all, we don't know what this fish needs to eat. We do know that they are, um, they have a subterminal mouth and they tend to eat off the bottom. So they're kind of a benthivore. They tend to eat more insects compared to our rainbow trout that are going to be piscivores. They're gonna eat fish in the wild. So the first thing we did was we wanted to just test the effect of three commercial diets that had varying protein and lipid ratios on the growth of these fish for 140 days. We kept them in the recirculating aquaculture system at 15 degrees for this study. And so we used three commercial diets. The scredding diet had 50%, or it was a 50, 20 protein lipid. We have a local Ontario uh, feed manufacturer called Blue Water. They gave us two different diets. One was a trout diet that was a 48, 18 protein to lipid. And then their tilapia diet was a little bit lower with a 46, 16 protein to lipid ratio. So we looked at the various body indices, so condition, uh, visceral somatic index, liposomatic index, hepasomatic index, in addition to just growth. So what you can see on the graph in front of you is that the black line, the blue water 4818 performed the best. It was a little bit better than the scredding 5020 diet, but it wasn't enough of a growth difference to be significant where we did see a significant effect was comparing the blue water 4818 to the blue water 4616. And this could be because that tilapia diet, the 4616 has a higher amount of soy in the diet. And we do know that soy uh, causes gut inflammation in some species. So that could be a contributing factor in that particular example. So after we finish that trial, we then moved forward with Dr. Uh, David Hoiben, who is in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. And he actually um, had one of his students design targeted diets for the species. So he wanted to look at the effect of dietary protein and lipid ratios and partial replacement of fish meal with insect meal on the growth performance and hepa, um, hepatic immune function in the Lake Whitefish juveniles. So this study ran in the cool water, so eight and a half degrees, uh, for about 112 days, and they had five different diets. So basically the control was that blue water 4818 that we used in the previous study, and then they made four experimental diets that were either low protein, high lipid, low protein, low lipid, high protein, high lipid, or high protein, low lipid. And similarly to the last study, they looked at 
growth, feed conversion, body indices, plasma biochemistry, and hepatic gene expression. So what did we learn from these two studies? Well, in the first project, we found that the blue water 4818 increased body weight and hepasomatic index. Uh, we found that it was the best for growth in this particular study. And we also found that that tilapia diet that had the increased soy content in it was not really palatable for the fish. And we know this because when we were feeding them, they would take it into their mouth and then you'd see them spit it back out again. So I think part of the reason why growth was reduced in that diet was because they weren't eating it as much because it didn't taste as good. So based on the results of that first project, um, project number two found that there was a significant increase in growth that was observed in the control diet, which was the, body, uh, the blue water 4818, and the high protein, high lipid diets. So the high protein, high lipid diet also reduced the viscerosomatic index. So that's the amount of viscera that came out of the fish compared to the overall body weight of the fish. And this is fairly important because one of the things that we've seen with this species is that they tend to um, store a lot of fat inside the abdominal cavity. So the fish might increase in body weight but when you actually remove all of those guts and try to take a fillet off of it, the fillet weight can still be fairly small. So we wanna try and make sure that when we're adding energy to the diet and it's going into that fish, that the energy is being stored as muscle tissue and not being stored as fat in the viscera. So the low lipid diets affected the several uh, plasma biochemistry profiles and hindered growth. So we've basically figured out from these two studies that low lipid diets are not ideal for this particular species. So there's a couple of directions that we want to go with this in the future. One of the big challenges that we're facing when it comes to our egg incubation is that we're getting a lot of mortality due to fungus. Because these eggs are so small, we have to incubate them in those um, upwellers or the bell jars or McDonald jars, depending on how you refer to them. And it's very, very difficult to try and manage fungus in that particular environment. So this coming fall, we're going to do some experiments with some chemical treatments to see if we can suppress fungus that way. Uh, we still need to do a little bit more investigation into nutritional for optimal growth. Um, we're now looking at doing some insect meal replacement to try and reduce the amount of fish meal in the diet and add something else instead. Um, one of our graduate students has been looking at replacement with cricket meal, um, superworms, which is actually a worm uh, that is grown for reptile feeders. And then of course, also black soldier fly larva, which is a common ingredient that's being used in some animal feeds right now. We also wanna take our temperature studies a little bit farther. So we know how they perform at 15 degrees, but we're kind of curious if we increase that temperature a little bit more, are we gonna be able to get a little bit more growth out of them without causing any um, issues with animal health? We also don't know how these animals grow from that fry stage to market in recirculating aquaculture. From our early experiments with in partnership with New North Fisheries, we found that it took over two years for them to get to a market size in the open water net pen environment. If I compare that to a trout, uh, most of our trout will come out of the water somewhere between 12 months and 18 months after stocking, depending on how warm the water temperature is. So having to wait 24 months to harvest your fish is a little bit too long from a producer perspective. So if we grow these fish in recirculating aquaculture for the entire life cycle, we'd like to better understand how much time that cuts off of their of their uh, life cycle and whether or not it actually makes up for the um, makes up for the difference in uh, energy that's used in recirculating aquaculture. And what we're actually trying right now is we're doing a little bit of a little study where we're um, changing the photo period. So we have them in one of our photo period labs and we're convincing them that it's summer right now when it's actually fall heading into winter because we wanna try and see if we can get them to breed in the spring instead of in the fall. If we had two cohorts a year of eggs that we could produce, it would be better for the industry so that they could do different, different stocking at different times. So going forward, there's a couple of steps, uh, next steps that we're looking at for commercial culture. We have had a number of meetings with um, Ontario farmers that are interested in culturing this species. In February of this year, we had a Lake Whitefish culture meeting where we were able to network with a number of different groups who are interested in culturing this, this group. So for our first effort here, our one-year-old Lake Whitefish juveniles that we've produced on site from our captive broodstock, 
we're going to be transferring them to Odawa Island Farms for grow out. And that's uh, with Sheshaguanin First Nation. So they've been um, fish farmers for, I think, at least six years now. Um, most of what they produce is rainbow trout. Last year, they did an experiment with coho salmon. And when they found out that we had lake whitefish, they were very interested in, in taking on some lake whitefish to try as well. Lake whitefish is a very, um, not only historically important species from a commercial fishing perspective, but it's very culturally important species for a lot of the indigenous communities around the Manitoulin Island area. So in partnership with Sheshaguanin, we're going to continue to collect data on these fish throughout the grow out stage to try and figure out how quickly we can get them to a market size. And when I refer to market size, I'm basically suggesting about a kilogram in body weight overall seems to be a good size at which we can um, cut large enough fillets off of those animals. So all of the fish that are going to be collected from um, this grow out site will be harvested locally. Uh, they'll be humanely harvested and then they're going to be processed at a commer commercial fish processor. And then a small number of those fish are going to be shipped to a company in the US called Acne, Sea or, sorry, Acne Smoked Fish. So we got in contact with them through our Lake Whitefish um, workshop sessions and they are a very large purchaser of Lake Whitefish from Canada. And most of the fish that they uh, purchase uh, is sold as a smoked product. So they're very interested in switching to aquaculture production from commercial wild fisheries because they have made a commitment to sustainability. So they want a small number of fish harvested from this group in order to do a taste test comparison between the farmed and the wild. And also there may be some differences in how they have to smoke these fish. Generally speaking, because the farmed fish are fed a um, high lipid diet and they're fed consistently throughout that grow out period, they tend to have more fat in the fillet or in the muscle compared to a wild fish that may not be getting, um, may not be getting to eat quite as often as a farmed fish would. So it might actually affect uh, the protocol that they need to use to smoke. So they want to do a very, a very small trial to see how these fish turn out using their commercial smokers. And then going forward, um, one of the communities in our area has secured funding for the development of two recirculating aquaculture facilities for lake whitefish in their territory. They plan on doing some of those lake whitefish for commercial culture, both for sale and for community use. And one of the other facilities that they're building is going to be explicitly for uh, production of juveniles that they plan to release into their traditional uh, waters for stocking efforts. We're also working in collaboration with six Indigenous nations, both here in Ontario and in Michigan, to develop training materials for lake whitefish culture. So one of the things that we really struggled with when we started this was how do you grow these fish and where do you find um, examples of places where people have done it before? So I previously mentioned that the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry does have success growing these fish and they do it very well, but not a lot of those um, protocols or, or practices are published anywhere where we can learn about it. So what we plan on doing in collaboration with these six nations is developing three different um, training practices. One is going to be a culture manual that people can download and read. The second one is going to be a YouTube series where we demonstrate how all of these practices are done on film. And then the third is going to be a combination of the written word and the videos by compiling it into an online course. So the goal here is going to be to have this course available for free to anyone who wants to take it so that they can learn and watch how we modify our practices a little bit in order to deal with the lake whitefish. So as we go forward, we're gonna to continue to seek funding for research uh, initiatives using a two-wide scene approach. This is something that we've been introduced to by our indigenous partners. Uh, and it's an approach of inquiry and solutions in which people come together to view the world through an indigenous lens with one eye or, or indigenous perspective, and then the other eye sees through a Western lens. So it's really been a great collaboration that we've been able to establish so far. Um, it's been a good opportunity for us to move forward in helping establish Lake Whitefish in some of these communities. So that's all I had for you in terms of our research updates. We have a whole lot of partners that we've worked with on all of these different projects. So of course, I want to recognize New North Fisheries because they're really the ones who, who kicked this off with our NSERC project with Colors Boreal. Um, we've also received funding through the Ontario Agri-Food Alliance 
um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We've had different feed companies like Sharp Farm Supplies and Okra Solutions kind of chip in on some of these feed trials. Uh, Dr. David Hoyben's lab was uh, instrumental in trying to help us out with some of this work as well. So was uh, Cedar Crest Trout Farm, Odawa Island Farms from Shushawani First Nation, Saugeen First Nation, and the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation are all involved as partners on these projects. So that's all I had for you for today. Thanks for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Thank you so much, Marcia. That was really well done. Um, Thanks. Is there any questions either online or in the room? Yeah, there's a couple here. All right. John, do you want to go first? Sure. Enjoy the, excuse me. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. My question is about uh, the sort of four categories of quality of eggs. Yeah. I wonder what yeah. you uh, found an association at all between the quality of eggs and the age or the size of age of some of the females that were being produced. So the um, the eggs were uh, they were all from our oldest females at, at the time when we started using this grading system. So the photo that I showed with the four different categories of eggs, those were from five-year-old females and it was the first time that they reproduced. What we did find was in the second year, so when they were six years old, we were we found that we were getting larger egg volumes. And so that was correlated with A, those fish were one year older, and then B, they were also larger in body size as well. So I do believe that the body size and age of the fish is going to correlate with better um, reproductive outcomes. So larger number of eggs are being produced, the quality of those eggs is greater, and hopefully we're getting greater um, re reproductive success or, or fertilization out of them. So this year, when they're seven years old, I'm hoping that we're going to see even greater numbers of eggs and more of those eggs that we would categorize as, you know, category three or, or best quality eggs. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Marcia. Thank you for your, your presentation. Um, I had a question regarding the fungus on the eggs. So yeah. you mentioned that that's the next big project is trying to figure out how to limit that. Uh, what are some of your ideas and have any of those things worked yet? So um, we've been working with a company in Ontario called MTS Environmental, and they are a company that produces natural products for a, ver a variety of, of purposes. So we've been working with their product that they have branded as AC Aqua. It's a humic acid. It's a combination of humic and fulvic acids. And this um, aquatic, aquatic, sorry, this uh, aqueous solution is basically extracted from lignite coal. And we have tested this product in our rainbow trout egg incubation and found that by simply dosing it into the incubators at a very low rate, we were able to completely eliminate fungus growth in the rainbow trout eggs. It also reduced the um, amount of known pathogens in the water. So we extracted, or we, we removed some of the water from these incubation trays and we did 16S sequencing to look at the bacterial community in the water. And we found that when the water was treated with this AC aqua, it increased the amount of beneficial bacteria and it decreased the amount of bacteria that are known pathogens like flavobacteria and aeromonas. So we did a small trial with our lake whitefish eggs where, where we treated them with this, but we didn't see the same outcome because we were only doing it as a static bath treatment instead of a long continuous treatment. So that's what we're going to do this year is because we have to use a recirculating system in order to bring that water temperature down during incubation, we have to calculate the total volume of water in the system and then dose it with this humic acid in order to try and keep it in suspension or in solution the whole time during the egg incubation. So that's what our project is for the fall. Great. Thank you. Good luck with it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have done like any studies looking at um, like feed on how well like the female can produce eggs. Um, so like different feeds like the different feed or something else and how well like those eggs turn out. We have not. So that is also something that would be interesting. At this point, we were just trying to figure out um, a nutritional kind of blend in terms of macronutrients and then see if we can reduce some of that fish meal with insect meal. Um, but every, everything that goes into a fish diet for that 
throwout phase is going to be a little bit different than what that fish needs going into their reproductive phase. So the broodstock diet that we've been feeding these animals is for rainbow trout. So it's higher in fat and protein during that um, kind of pre-seasoning time right before they get into their reproductive uh, capacity. But we're not, we have really no idea if that's the right nutrition for them during their spawning window. So that's definitely something that we'd like to look at going forward is whether or not we need to have a specialized diet for them uh, during their uh, spawning. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I was wondering, like, um, so you're talking about the commercialization of aquaculture of like whitefish, and I was wondering if they're ready to be commercially, uh, like placed in, in um, commercial like culturing or what still needs to be done for that. I'd say we're ready for pilot testing. So, uh, new North fisheries did 4 years of pilot testing. They were able to get the animals to market, but they were also doing it on a fairly long time scale. Like I said, the 2 years of production time was a little bit long. Um, and they got a wide range of variation in their size. So as we go forward with growing fish or growing offspring from fish that we're holding in captivity, we're going to also be applying some selective breeding practices in order to try and make a little bit more uniform fish in terms of growth. And if we can get them to be more uniform, then they're going to be better off for that grow out phase. So I would say we're still in the pilot testing at this point. We're going to do a test with Odawa Island Farms and um, hopefully in a couple of years, we'll do a test with uh, Saugeen First Nation when they have their facility operational. But I don't think we're quite at the point yet where we could say it's a commercial species. And of mm -hmm. course, one of the limiting factors going forward is going to be broodstock. So we're not gonna be able to produce enough eggs to supply an entire province or an entire um, you know, country of eggs. So we need this to become successful to a point where someone in the industry is gonna wanna take on breeding activities so that they can be an, an egg multiplier as well. Right on, thank you. Are you guys going to start selecting this year or or not not quite yet? Yes. Yeah, no, I think we're at the point where we're going to start applying some selection. At before we were just trying to, we were just breeding anyone who gave us eggs. Like <laughs> just getting we, eggs. Yeah. yeah, we just our whole goal was just to get eggs and see if we could get them to hatch. But uh now that I think we've figured that out. Uh, we are going to try to work towards uh, doing a little bit of selection this year as we're doing our breeding. Right on, thank you. Uh, there's also a question online. Um, have you had any oh, um, have you had any rough calculation of FCR or feed conversion rate? We have been doing uh, FCR calculations, but it's it's not great. So I would say the best FCR that we had data that we have is from our feed trials because we hand fed the fish during that time so that we could observe their feeding behavior so that when they stopped showing interest in the feed, we would stop presenting it. Uh, because generally speaking, what we do at this facility is we overfeed. So we'll see FCRs between like 1.3 and 1.6 with this species because we're trying to make sure that there's always feed there so that they're able to eat whenever they're hungry. Uh, whereas when we did the feeding trials where we were hand feeding them and actually paying more attention to when they stopped feeding, we were able to bring those um, FCRs down closer to what you would expect for a salmon or a trout in the range of 1.1 to 1 1.2. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and if there's no other questions, um, online or, or in person, um, we can give everyone back their day and, uh, and I know you're very busy. So I really, really appreciate your time, Marcia. Um, it was great to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Perfect. Um, we have. We have another um, seminar series in two weeks, I believe, on the 16th, right? Um, so same time, same place. So we hope to see you then. Let's record it.